the 13th, so we are in Proverbs 13. How's that going for you guys? You working your way through all right? I hope you're, I hope you're enjoying it. Uh, Proverbs 13 is where we're at in the Bible today. I, um, my comfort zone, Larry, is simplicity. Okay? I, I, I like simple. I, I really do. I mean, I know that may shock you a little bit, but I, I really do like, you know, simple. Because then you don't have to break your brain. Simple's good. You know, that's why I'm married. I just do what I'm told. <laughs> that's simple. You know, my wife has to carry the weight. Yeah, she says, no, it doesn't work that way. It does. Trust me, it does. Matter of fact, there's this, um, there's this philosophical principle theory uh, out there called Occam's Razor. You heard of that before? You have, because I've said it. It has nothing to do with Gillette. It has nothing to do with, um, what is that one, the cross swords? Uh, raising shaver thing it has nothing to do with that. Occam's razor is a principle that says if there's a simple answer to a problem, that's probably it. That, I, that's why I like it so much. Somebody sent me an email one time that said if you got a horse that doesn't uh, run anymore, it's died. What can you do? I said, well, you can say it's dead. Or, and then it gives like 35 lists of things like you could reclassify it as underperforming. You can change the conditions so that it meets the criteria of a living horse. You know? And all these things. And, and don't you realize that we do that in life? You know, instead of just taking the simple solution, we complicate things. When you look historically at some of the big events that have happened, often there is a very simple explanation. The destruction of the Hindenburg. Y'all remember that, right? Anybody here on board? No. Vi remembers it though. Her husband was stationed at, uh, at uh, uh, Lake Newhurst Station when it, when it went down. Uh, and she's sick, by the way. Keep her in your prayers. Uh, you know what, what, what doomed the Hindenburg? Nope. It's paint. It's paint was conducive to sparks in a storm. So the dope that was on it, which I kind of find good, you know, it was stupid to use it, so let's call it dope, all right? The paint was the gateway to all that happened with, uh, with uh, the Hindenburg. If you look through, like, y'all remember Apollo 13? I was alive for that. Remember that? Guy's halfway to the moon, actually a little more than halfway, and oxygen tank explodes. You know what caused that? A frayed wire. Little tiny frayed wire. Little simple thing. Nothing major. Nobody did anything wrong. Just this little simple wire. The insulation melted off of it and boom, it went. You know what sank the Titanic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Binoculars sank the Titanic. The lookouts, which, you know, I, again, I kind of, I know the loss of 1,500 lives isn't humorous, but I find funny that you have lookouts who have no binoculars. If they'd have had the binoculars, which they left in port, they'd have seen the, the, the iceberg sooner and probably could have avoided it. Simple little things. I was sharing uh, last week at Bible study, which... If you aren't joining us on Wednesday for Bible study, we're taking a look at finances. I don't know if that'll help our attendance or drive it down, but I just want you to know that we're taking a look at the biblical approach to finances. Uh, I was talking to them about a friend of mine who had computer problems. And uh, he said, Jim, it doesn't power up. And I said, okay. He says, I pressed the button. It doesn't come on. All right. What's wrong with it? I said, is it plugged in? Well, never mind, Jim. I'll take care of this myself. Simple problems. When I started reading Proverbs 13, there's a lot of things in Proverbs 13, right? Y'all have read it already because it's the 13th and that you started your day off reading the word, right? When I started reading Proverbs 13, there's a lot of things in there. 
There's a lot of really good things in there. Said that, you know, the ransom of a man's life in verse 8 is his, is his wealth, you know, but the poor hears no rebuke. You go, okay, well, you know, my, my wealth can hold me, but, you know, maybe if I don't have a whole lot, there's nothing to get in trouble over. Uh, a wicked messenger falls into adversity, but a faithful on, envoy brings healing. Well, that's good. Don't tell lies, and, you know, people probably won't be upset with you, you know. All right, that's, that's pretty good. Abundant food is in the, the fallow ground of the poor, but it's swept away by injustice. Well, you know, we probably shouldn't treat people unfairly. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in Proverbs 13, but I, I couldn't get past verse 1. I mean, I just was stuck on verse 1. Take a look at what verse 1 says, because I really think that, that verse 1 is the key to unlocking not only ver Proverbs 13, but the whole of the book of Proverbs and the whole of the Bible, it says, A wise son accepts his father's discipline, but a scoffer doesn't listen to rebuke. I think in reading that, that it's pretty safe to say that Solomon thought that it was wise to be able to accept correction. Right? I mean, I, 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 I think that that's pretty evident. As he gets ready in, in, in this collection of Proverbs to unfold all these great truths, he kind of stops and says, you know what? If you're smart, you'll listen. <laughs> yeah! And that's what I kept thinking about. I mean, I know it's a simple truth. I know it's, I know it's one of those, well, <laughs> duh, Jim. But how many of us don't? How many times do we just not listen? Or, or as my grandma used to say, it goes in one ear and out the other. You know, you've been talking to your kids and your kids say, well, Dad, you know what about that? And you go, well, yeah, 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 but, 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 but. And I, well, son, yeah, 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 but, 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 but. And they're not listening. You're trying to tell them, but they're just not listening. So, you know, just look at your kid and go, wah, 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 wah. If they're not going to listen, why say anything? I mean, if we're not going to be, have, it, have a teachable spirit, what's the point of, of any of it? I mean, if you're not going to be one who accepts a father's discipline, then what do the rest of the, the Proverbs mean? I mean, if you're not going to listen, why even read through to, you know, the righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the stomach of the wicked is, is in need. If you're not going to listen, why even read it? Matter of fact, if you're not going to listen, why even read the Bible? Well, because you have to. Why? Why do you suppose that Proverbs was collected? Why do you suppose? And I honestly think this is what happened. Solomon, who, who was asked of God, what would you like? And Solomon's answer was, Lord, I just want to be a wise man. I just want to be able to rule Israel wisely. And God says, boy, that just, that touches my heart. You're not thinking about yourself. You didn't pray for gold and sheep and, you know, a, did you see the 110-inch plasma? Didn't ask for that. You just want to guide my children well. And so he gave him, gave him an abundance of wisdom. And so Solomon said, you know what? Let me collect these so that the nation of Israel could benefit. Matter of fact, if you go over to Proverbs chapter 1, you don't have to do it now. But if you look at the first and the last verses of Proverbs chapter 1, this is what Solomon said. That it was compiled that people might know wisdom and instruction to discern the sayings of understanding so that they can live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. Solomon said, that's why I did it. I want the people of Israel to be able to know right from wrong, to be able to benefit from my wisdom, and to be able to live securely. Boy, isn't that a great thing? The women say, maybe. Yeah, amen. The guys say, instructions? Who needs instructions? Yeah, I know, I know. I, I buy a VCR. I throw the, the instructions away too. And then we stumble and try to figure it out. It's a good thing to be able to learn from somebody else, isn't it? Isn't it really? Hello? <laughs> it's okay. I like that. We get new phones that have new things and we use old ringtones. 
It's like getting a computer that's got all these type fonts, and then what do you do? You set your font for typewriter. <laughs> I love it. Isn't it good to be able to learn from other people? I mean, if you've ever learned a trade or learned a craft, you probably learned at the feet of somebody else, right? I mean, you watched them, you observed them, you interacted with them, you learned at their feet from their accomplishments and from their mistakes. That's a good thing. I mean, if, if, if I'm learning electrical stuff and, and I'm working with a guy and he takes 220, I'm going to learn that I shouldn't touch and I'm glad that he did and I didn't. It's a good thing. We realize that. But yet when it comes to, the, comes to the Bible, sometimes we go, well, no, that's not why it's here. It's here because God says we have to read it. So we read it like we read a dictionary. Anybody here sit around and read the dictionary? Not too many people. We read it like we read the encyclopedia. You know, or I guess we go online now to the encyclopedia. Got to find out about lizards. So, you know, you read it because you want to find out about lizards. You read about lizards and then you go on and you don't worry about it until you need to look something else up. And we deal with the Bible that way. But Solomon says that I, I, I collected these together so that you might be able to learn from my experiences with the Lord in order that you might live securely. Matter of fact, the entire Bible, if you look at John's writing, John says that he wrote these things that people might know that they have eternal life. So indeed, not only are the book, is the book of Proverbs, but the entire Bible is written that you might glean truth that will enrich and benefit your life. But if you're not going to listen, throw it out. There's a constitutional law professor at Georgetown University that has written a book and came out last week and said, you know what, let's throw away the Constitution. He goes, why not? We're not following it anyway. Let's throw away the Bible if we're not going to heed it. If we're not going to be like Solomon says right here, accept the Father's discipline. Now you go, well, you know, let, let's talk about this a little bit. I'm glad you asked because we're going to. When the Bible talks about discipline, it's not talking about smacking you around. It's talking about directing you in a way toward growth. I've shared with y'all before my grandmother's famous uh, climbing roses and the, the grave disappointment that I found out as a 13-year-old boy that them nasty things don't do that on their own. I thought they, you just planted them in the ground and you let them go and they just twisted all. I thought it was a wondrous plant until I found her out there tying them up. And I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm making it climb along. I said, it doesn't do that naturally? No. You got to train it. You got to tie it down. You got to discipline it. That's what discipline is. So a child is very wise when he trusts his father and, he, and his father says, you know what, son? I want to tie you down in some ways and loosen you in others in order that you might become the person that would honor God. And the son says, I trust you, Dad, and I'll, I'll let you do that. I'll submit to your authority. I'll submit to your discipline because you're just trying to shape me into a person that honors God. That's a wise decision. Wouldn't you agree? But do we really? Let's go back to our electrician friend who's watching his friend curl his hair in benefit of electricity. And he looks at him and he says, now look, you do this and you do this. I don't know what this and this is because I stay away from electricity. You do this and you do this. And the guy says, really? Well, what if you do this instead of that and these instead of those? He says, no, 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 no. You'll electrocute yourself. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I think I've got a better way to do it. And we all said that at one point or another. And sometimes we're right. The guy that invented the AM radio for the car did it because he didn't know he couldn't. You know that? They said that you could not build an antenna big enough to fit in a car so you couldn't make a radio and a guy didn't know that so he did it. Great. And amongst human understanding that happens. But really we're talking about God here. So God says some things but you and I stand back and go wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe there's a better way. Instead of just sitting down and saying, you know what, Lord, I trust your word. I, 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 trust, I, I trust you, so I trust your word. If we, if we don't do that, then let me tell you something. The 
value and the wisdom that God offers in this book is voided and valueless if we're not willing to listen. You might as well throw it away. You might as well not read it. You might as well give your Bible to somebody else who will. If you're not going to come before God with a teachable spirit. Makes sense? Yeah, I think so. It's a good thing. It is profitable. It benefits a person to have a spirit that is teachable. To say, you know what? Maybe I don't have all the answers. Maybe I do. I mean, usually when we reject something, we reject it because we believe that what we have is right. Correct? I mean, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I want to give you a car and, you know, in exchange for yours, if you think your car is better than theirs, you're going to say, no, I don't want it. You're going to reject it, right? Rejection's a choice. I look at things and I go, okay, yeah, no, no, I think what I've got is better, so I reject the other thing. That's usually what people do. And with you and I, that could be right. I could come to you and say, you know, that such and such is the best thing in the world, and you can look at it, you can examine it, you can figure it, and you can say, no, no, I don't think you're right. And you, you could absolutely be correct. But when it comes to God, that's not true. You can't do that. You can't. Understand. The Bible makes it pretty clear, and life teaches that the ways of God are distinct from ours, higher than we are, and as the Bible puts it, the hidden things belong to Him. I cannot grasp all that God knows. I just can't. Now you may not accept that, you may, you may reject that. I understand that. But Truth is truth. You go, well, how can you prove that? Anybody ever heard of Stephen Hawking? Sure. Stephen Hawking is a man that is confined to a wheelchair and he interacts with the world through his, uh, through his computer. That's his voice, everything. He holds the Newtonian chair at Cambridge. That's the chair that Newton, Isaac Newton held. He's a pretty smart dude. I mean, he's a, he's a thinker and he's deep and he could lose me in four words. You know, he could, he could put together a four word sentence and I'd be going, I don't have a clue, you know. And if he can do that to me, what do you think about God? Because God made him. God made him with the capacity to think that deeply. Now, I'm not saying everything he thinks is right, but this dude is a deep thinker. You know people like that, don't you? You ever known a mathematician? Oh my gosh. It's like you got brain damage. How can X4 plus 3B equal 9, 4 to the 8th power? What? And we go, yeah, yeah, just, you know, 2 plus 2, that works for me. We can't understand that, right? I mean, the words ge ge uh, uh, geometry and trigonometry, those are four-letter words with more than four letters. And if a person can do that to you, and they're a created being, why is it hard to believe that God could not stump you and cause you to go, hmm, maybe I don't have it all. Usually when people reject the, re well, reject anything, but particularly when it comes to, to God, it's because they question the validity of its truth. And they usually question it based on a simple thing of, you know what, it doesn't match my plans or my perspectives. Right? I reject that because, well, it just doesn't work for my life. Or it doesn't match my experiences. I love dealing with people, and they'll tell me, and especially young preachers, they'll say, well, you know, it's the church I serve, blah, 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 blah. And I'll go, well, you know, you really ought to do this. And they go, oh, no, 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 no. I said, how long have you been pastoring? Two months. <laughs> and so I like to look at them and say, well, you tell me from your vast wealth of inexperience what I know from my wealth of experience to not be true. But what I'm saying doesn't conform to their values or to their experiences. And so somehow in our arrogance, we think that we've got it all figured out. So we reject it. You know, like people who think the Cowboys are the best team in the NFL. Okay? Any Cowboy fans? They're not going to admit it now. You know, they go, oh, they're the best. And somebody else will come along and say, no, the, you know, so-and-so are the best. And, you know, it's like, okay, you're both right. Because that lines up with your values. 
But if somebody were to come along and say, but statistically, and they lay out these things, they go, I don't know, the so-and-sos are the best. And they'd say, oh, no, I just can't accept that. I reject that notion. Why? Because it doesn't conform to their values and their priorities. And people will reject the truths of God because they do not, al they do not align with their plans and their, their values, their priorities. You know, God says, don't sleep with your girlfriend. And they go, well, I reject that. Why do you suppose that is? Go ahead. Say it. They don't want to sleep with their girlfriend. Okay? Don't do this. Usually you reject that because that's what we want to do. People also reject the word of God because they place trust in contradictory information. If God says this, people will say, well, I've always believed. And then they'll share some other piece of information. They'll say, well, you know, I grew up in a church that taught this. Well, let me tell you something. The truth of God and what churches teach are not always the same thing. You understand that? It is a good thing to find a pastor in a church that teaches the Word of God. It's a good thing. Because there are some out there that do not. A friend of mine grew up in a church that would not allow any musical instrument in the church. Any. Except the harp and the trumpet. You know why? Because they're mentioned in the Bible. I don't know too many people that play a harp anymore. Actually, in the Bible, it's called a liar, and there's a lot of liars in church. <laughs> anyway, um, a lot of a lot of harp music, and you know, a trumpet by itself it gets old after a while, especially in an enclosed space. Then he went to another church that said, if you could roll it in and hook it up, you can play it. Bam! It's like wow, but what does God's word say? See, a lot of times we, we base our life on information that, you know, maybe it's church-related or maybe it's self-related. I like to call it folk theology. You know, God helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible. And you know what? The message of salvation is God helps those who can't help themselves. I can't die for my own sins. He did it for me. My sin got me in trouble. He got me out of it. God helps those who can't help themselves. All right? But I build my life around this folk theology. Rather than to sit down and to take a look and let God honestly speak to me from the Bible. Now, I'll tell you what. I think it's good for those who handle the Word of God to study and to be well prepared and well equipped. But that is not a prerequisite for understanding the Bible. The only prerequisite for understanding the Bible is a hungering heart in the Spirit of God. And He will speak to you. He will reveal Himself to you. Not only do sometimes we reject God's Word because of our values, our priorities, our plans. Not only because, you know, we, 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 we trust contradictory information. But this is probably the, the top one. I like this one. Emotions. Okay? Emotions. Which is never a good reason to make a decision. So, you go out and you buy a car. My brother sold cars for a while. And he says, you know, we take them for a test drive. And he goes, we had to take them a specific way. I said, really? He goes, yeah. He said, one of the places we had to take them by was this big building with, with mirrored windows. I said, you're kidding me. He goes, no. Because we wanted them to see themselves in that car. I, you jerk. I knew I didn't like car salesmen for a reason. <laughs> You know, you want you to look good in that car. Yeah, man, this Mustang wrapped around. I look good. I look, yeah. They want you to make an emotional decision. They don't want you to make an informed decision. And then we go, well, my heart tells me that I need to go out and buy that new 110-inch TV at the Consumer Electronics Show. And so I'll pray about it. And I'll go, Lord, if you don't want me to do this, <laughs> let the store be out of stock. God, if you don't want me to do this, then, then um, yeah, um, make the sun stand still. You know, we throw some fleece out there. We're not asking him. We're, we we want to do it. We're making a decision based on emotions. It's never right to make a decision based on emotions. Never. I'm not saying emotions don't play a factor. I'm not asking you to be Mr. Spock. 
I'm just telling you that if emotions are the leading thing, you're probably, more times than not, you're going to end up in trouble. You're going to end up doing something you're going to look back on and go, boy, that was bad. And you all like to do auctions? Auctions. eBay. Go to real ones. I don't take my wife to real ones. She gets excited. <laughs> my brother was bidding at an auction one time, and he bought something for 50 bucks, and it was worth 10. <laughs> I love it. I have it now. It didn't cost me 50 bucks. <laughs> And I dangle it in his face and go, remember this? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, I got caught up in it. Yeah. So sometimes when, we, when the truths of God confront us, you know what? It touches a nerve. And we just reject it out of hand. Because you know what? That reminds me too much of my dad or my mom. or That reminds me of when God let me down and I'm angry at God over that. You know, it's good to have a teachable spirit, but there's a lot of reasons that we don't. And when we don't have a teachable spirit, take a look at what he says there. When we don't have a teachable spirit, one who doesn't listen to rebuke is a scoffer. A scoffer. You know, the Bible uses the word stupid and fool. And, and it does not use it lightly. Matter of fact, over in Proverbs uh, 11, I believe it is, this, this verse is almost repeated there. Only, only the, the writer, say, uh, Solomon says, it's stupid to reject instruction. You can go to, do a search, pull up your Bible and look up the words foolish and stupid. And this is what you find. This is the picture that you find. A person who rejects what is true to embrace what is wrong. And we would agree with that. We really would. If you find yourself digging a hole, it's stupid to keep digging, right? If you find yourself in debt, it's foolish to keep going in debt. Wait a minute. That's a whole other message. Well, send this one to Washington, would you? It's foolish if you find yourself in debt to keep going in debt. Husbands, once you've put your foot in your mouth, it is stupid to put the other one in there. Right? That's what the Bible means when it says foolish and stupid. Is that God who is apart from sin, who is the creator of all that exists, who has a desire that you would find fulfillment and happiness. That's why he's given you this whole Bible. When he says here it is as a gift for you that you might find me that we then reject that which is true and embrace that which is wrong. It's stupid. Remember, I said we could do that with one another. If I want to talk about electrical stuff, I go to Larry. Larry knows more about electrical stuff than I do. If I want to know something about construction, I go and talk to Jerry. Jerry knows more about construction than I do. If I want to know about birth pains, I don't know why, but if I do, I talk to my wife. She knows about birth pains more than I do. It would be stupid of me to say, you know what, I know Larry's an expert in electrical stuff, but I know more than Larry. Be stupid. It's the same thing we do to God. We look at his word and we say, you know what, God, maybe I just, maybe I just know more than you. All right, I'll give you that. Maybe you do. But what if you're wrong? What if you don't? What if you don't? What if, and look, let's just be foolish. What if God knows more than you on this one? And you reject the truth. And you embrace a lie. Or you, you reject truth and you embrace something less than truth. It doesn't even have to be a lie. What if you do that? And you look back and you go, Man, was I ever foolish. And I'm sad to say that, well, I think probably all of us to one degree or another could probably say that in life. Would you agree? Would you, would you agree that there was probably a point in life where you made a decision and, and, and maybe even it was one that you, at that time, you knew. God says A and I'm going to do B. And then you get down the line and you realize that God's A was better than your B. You ever been there? 
And you go, man, was I ever foolish to do that? What if you're wrong? What if it's just possible that God's right 100% of the time and you're not? Are you willing to be foolish? You know, the Bible, God himself repeatedly calls us to, to try him, to test him. You say, oh, wait a minute, Pastor. The Bible says don't, don't tempt God. I'm not saying you tempt him. But remember in Malachi when he's talking to them about, you know, giving into the storehouse. And he says, go ahead, try me. Go ahead, come on. Do what I say and, it, you know, see if I don't bless. Do what I say, what you think is wrong, and see if I'm not proven right. Remember in the book of Isaiah chapter 7, we talked back at Christmas about the virgin birth of Jesus, the incarnation, that prophecy that started it all. And, and we go, well, what's it talking about? God says to the king, he says, go ahead, try me, test me. Put me on the spot, see if I don't do it. And the king goes, oh, no, I won't do that. God says, okay, then I'll do it myself. You won't ask for it, I'll give it anyway. God asks us to test him all the time. Because the reality of the matter, the reality of the matter, the reality of the matter is this. God's word is infallible. It is without error. Now my interpretation could be wrong. Your understanding could be wrong. But what God says is not wrong. There was a guy one time that said that it was his opinion that the word of God would not last his lifetime. You know what they're using his house for today? Printing Bibles. Every time somebody has honestly, honestly looked at the word of God, they have found it to be true. Remember, there's a lot of reasons you can reject it. But anybody that has honestly looked at it has found it to be true every time. So if you want to sit there and you want to say, you know what, I think I'm right and God's wrong, I'll give you that. I mean, no disrespect, I think it's stupid, I think it's foolish. You understand where I'm coming from? But I respect that. But if you're going to do that, make an informed decision. Don't reject it because it doesn't line up with your values. Don't reject it because you just can't conceive of it. Don't reject it because you're mad at God and you know you really want this or that. Take a look at it. Examine it. Question it. Try to tear it apart. And you know what? If you're really looking for truth, you'll find truth every time. So let's understand. The wise man opens the word of God and accepts God's discipline. That's the ultimate extension of this truth. If not, then why have it at all? Just pages, just ink. If you don't believe that this is the Word of God to teach you and it offers life, then why read it at all? It gives life. It gives hope. It gives direction. The question is, is whether or not we're going to be wise enough to accept it. So Father, to you we come. We ask that you would Help us, Father, to look beyond our own selves. To allow genuine truth to sink into our souls and to enrich us and to transform us into the people that you would have us to be. Father, I ask for those here who may wrestle with that that, Lord, today you would bubble the words of this message up through their soul. And, Lord, give them a boldness to explore the Word of God. To explore what you have said. That they may find for themselves that it is true. Lord, this all we pray and ask because of Jesus Christ. Amen.